Hello and welcome to a presentation on typhoid and paratyphoid fever by Dr. Ignacio Skoll. Today the lecture will be a bit different. We'll talk in a more story-like pattern. We'll see what happens in a typical case of typhoid or paratyphoid fever, both of which are commonly called as enteric fever. Welcome to Dr. Ignacio Skoll's medical tutorial. So today we will learn introduction, mode of transmission, clinical features, We'll learn the differences between typhoid and paratyphoid fever. We'll learn about the complications. We'll learn about the investigations. And we'll learn about the treatment of both complicated and uncomplicated cases. So the term enteric fever includes typhoid fever caused by Salmonella enterica via typhi and paratyphoid fever caused by Salmonella enterica via paratyphi A, B or C. Paratyphoid infections constitutes about 20% of all cases of infection enteric fever all right so this is the bacteria the salmonella enterica so suppose uh, there is a boy who, who has been suffering from uh, salmonella typhi or the enteric fever so he passes stool on random places and then through his fingers or through flies and their eggs through fields and the food growing in the fields ill washed foods and through the poorly sealed toilet barrier the uh, is feces which is the food of another person and then this person eat it and now he will show the symptoms let's see what symptoms he shows so after 10 to 14 days jack will show a fever the fever will be a step ladder type of fever which means that the temperature will increase reaches a peak decrease and again increase and reaches a new peak and decrease Again increase, reaches a new peak and decrease. This way, it will continue on increasing to new peaks, giving a stepladder pattern on a graph. Compare this blue stepladder pattern with the red abrupt rise in temperature. You can see clearly see the difference. So Jack will now develop this stepladder type of fever. And for 4 to 5 days, this fever will be present till it reaches the peaks, peak. And the fever will be assisted with malaise, increased headache, there will be drowsiness, the child will sleep a lot, and there will also be aching in the limbs. In adults, there will be constipation. So how the constipation occurs is that there will be swelling of lymphoid tissue in the ileocecal junction. The typhoid fever will affect the ileocecal junction. It will affect the pears patches present in the ileocecal junction. The ileocecal junction will swell up, the pear's patches will be inflamed, and there will be constipation. But since Jack is a little boy, he will have diarrhea and he will have vomiting. And this diarrhea and vomiting will be prominent in the early in the illness. So since he's a little boy, he has diarrhea and vomiting. If he was an adult, he will have constipation. So we know that with temperature increase in temperature, the pulse will also be rapid. But in case of typhoid, Related to the temperature, the pulse is slower, so there will be relative bradycardia. The pulse is often slower than would be expected from the height of the temperature, that is relative bradycardia. So Jack will have diarrhea, vomiting and a relative bradycardia too. Now what happens at the end of the first week? So 7 days have passed, nearly passed, it's the 6th or 7th day. And since Jack is a very white boy, he will have a rash. The rash will appear on the upper abdomen and on the back is sparse, slightly raised, rose red spots, also called rose red spots. Remember this term. These rose red spots will fade on the pressure. So this is the rose red spot on the back of the Jack's, Jack's back. It is usually visible only on white skin. So since Jack is white, these rose red spots are visible. In dark skin, they are not visible. And cough will also occur. And the stacks is also occur. So at the fifth or sixth or seventh day, at the end of the first week, what we see is rose, red spots, cough, and epistaxis. Now around the seventh to ten day, the spleen becomes palpable. So constipation in adults is followed by diarrhea and abdominal distension with tenderness, bronchitis, and delirium may develop. So we can see around seven to ten days, the spleen has enlarged. The Jack's spleen has become palpable, his abdomen has become distended, there is tenderness, and there is delirium. 
Jack is clearly confused, there is bronchitis, and if untreated, by the end of the second week, at about 12 to 14 days, the patient may become profoundly ill. So what is the difference between typhoid and paratyphoid fever? In paratyphoid fever, the course tends to be shorter and milder than typhoid fever. The onset is more abrupt with acute enteritis. The rash may become more abundant. The intestinal complications are less frequent. So in paratyphoid fever, the symptoms are relatively less. The course is shorter, is milder. The onset is abrupt and the rashes are abundant, but the complications are less frequent. So this, this table shows what we discussed. In the first week, there is fever, headache, myalgia, relative bradycardia, constipation, and in children, there is diarrhea and vomiting. End of the first week, there are rose spots on trunk, splenomegaly, cough, abdominal distension, and diarrhea. End of second week, there are delirium, bronchitis, complication, then coma, and death. We discuss this in the form of a story. And what are the complications of typhoid fever? There we can discuss this under four headings. One, the effect on the bowel. Since the pears patches are inflamed, the, there can be perforation through the pears patches and the perforation can lead to hemorrhage. Imagine the pears patches on the ileocecal junction and they, are, they can be perforated due to inflammation and they can be hemorrhaged. A septic foci, the bacteria can travel to bone and joint and can cause bone and joint infection. And they can also cause meningitis. They can cause septic arthritis, they can cause osteomyelitis, they can cause meningitis in the brain, and most common of it, they can cause cholecystitis. And there can also be toxic phenomena due to toxins produced by the salmonella bacteria. So the toxic phenomena can be myocarditis and nephritis. Toxic phenomena of the heart, myocarditis, toxic phenomena in the kidneys, nephritis. And if there is chronic caries, if the bacteria persist for a long time in the gallbladder, there can be persistent gallbladder caries. This persistent gallbladder caries, just remember the case of Typhoid Mary. Typhoid Mary was a cook, her name was Mary, she carried typhoid in a gallbladder. And the foods which she cooked without proper hygiene was spreaded to the people who ate it. So she spread it typhoid everywhere. She spread it typhoid to 60 or 70 people. She was the index case. So remember, you can carry typhoid in the gallbladder. There can be a chronic carry stays. Investigations. So to remember what are the investigations, you can remember Basu. This is Bipasa Basu, a Bollywood actress. So you can remember Basu. B A S U. B for Lord. In the first week, we can do blood culture, A for antibody. In the second week, we can do antibody test, a Vidal test, S for stool test in the third week, and U for urine test in the fourth week, so BASU. But, so physicians, we need more detailed. So what does the B stand? Blood, so in blood, we can do total leukocyte count and differential leukocyte count in which we will see normal to low leukocyte count with absolute eosinopenia. This is one of the conditions in which eosinophils will decrease and neutrophilic predominance. Since this is a bacterial condition, the neutrophils will increase. We may also see anemia and thrombocytopenia in advanced illness. We can see mild elevation of transaminases, the hepatic transaminases, ALT, EST may be mildly elevated, elevated CRP. So the gold standard for diagnosis of typhoid is blood culture. As we already discussed in BASU, the sensitivity is greatest in the first week, around 90%, but drops to 40% in the fourth week. Bone marrow cultures. Uh, normally for typhoid, we don't do bone marrow cultures, but in cases of when typhoid or enteric fever presents with pyrexia of unknown origin, then bone marrow cultures can be done. It is very sensitive. And Uh, so the viral test detects the presence of IgG and IgM antibodies to etch the flagella antigen of Salmonella enterica varitaphi and paratyphi A and B and O, the somatic antigen common to typhi and paratyphi A and B. So it will detect antibodies to H and O antigen. A single titer of at least 1 is to 160 for both O and H is considered positive. 
This is a treatment. In areas where quinolones, fluoroquinolones resistance is infrequent, fluoroquinolones are the drug of choice. So we can give superfloxacin 500 mg twice daily in areas where quinolone resistance is not present. But in most areas, especially in the South Asia, the quinolone resistance are very much frequent. They are present. So we don't usually give this. It is not given in many areas of the world. What we give is for uncomplicated cases where there are no complicated features, we will give cephaloscoporin, the oral cefixim, at a dose of 20 mg per kg per day. This is the dose for children, is the drug of choice. But we can give other dose too, we can give cefixim. And the second choice is azithromycin, 10 to 20 mg per kg per day, or 500 mg. This is a good choice, second choice isn't. Other second line agents are chloramphenicol, the dose is given here for children 50 to 50 mg per kg per day, or 500 mg four times daily. Amoxicillin or clotrimoxazole, two tablets or IV equivalent twice daily are the second line agents. So, for uncomplicated cases, we'll give cefixim or, or azithromycin or these other drugs. Complications So, for severe illness and where complications are present, intravenous ceftriaxone and cefotaxime are used at a dose of 100 mg per kg per day and 200 mg per kg per day, respectively. Well, if this dose is a bit high, we can also use 50 to 75 mg per kg per day for safe triaxone and about 100 to 150 mg per kg per day for cefotaxime. For oral dose, this is for safe triaxone, it is 1 gram twice daily. In patients with history of penicillin or cephalosporin LSE, astrionam, chloramphenicol in higher doses, and cotrimoxazole in higher doses are used as second line agents. So, about the use of this uh, IV agents or parenteral drugs. This is continued until defervescence or fever is uh, this fever disappears, oral intrinsic improves, and complication results. So after these three conditions are fulfilled, we can give oral drugs. After the fever has gone, oral intrinsic has improved, and complications has disappeared, we'll give a oral intake, oral drugs. So oral drugs can be oral suffixim, and we will give this therapy for a total of 14 days. The therapy is given for a total of 14 days. So what are the treatments for carriers? So carriers carry the bacteria in the gallbladder and can spread to many other people. So in view of public safety, we can give, we have to give, treat them. We have to treat them with ciprofloxacin. This is a previous resume. They, are, they have been resistant to it. So we can either give four weeks with ciprofloxacin or alternative agents is usually azithromycin. This is guided by antimicrobial sensitivity testing. Cholecystectomy may be necessary, but this is rare. Thank you. Subscribe.